Shalom, everyone. It's good to see you on a Wednesday night. This is uh, Rod's not going to be here tonight. He's supposed to have a new grandson or granddaughter tonight. His daughter went in for uh, maternity. So anyway, wishing him well as he babysits all the grandkids. Besides that, I want to start by talking a little trivia. And I don't know how many of you understand or recognize, you know, Parsha Naso is what we're working on this week, it is the longest Parsha in the Torah, 176 verses. Do you know what the longest psalm is and how many verses it has? Answer, 119 has 100 and... 76 verses. And what's the longest book in the Talmud? Bhava Batra. And how long is it? 176 pages. Interesting. Now, 176 is a, is a gematria. And there were two phrases that came up when Rabbi Ginsburg and Rabbi Winston were looking at this, and they came to the conclusion that it begins in Psalm 92.6, where it says, How great are your works, Havaya, the Hashem. And the other one's in Deuteronomy 11.21, where it says, So that your days may be many. We're going to talk, well, I, I've... I had so many ideas what I wanted to talk about, but I finally settled on one. I want to talk about words. And again, I want to talk about the first word of our Torah or of this particular Parsha, which is Naso. Naso. Naso is spelled Nun. And it's not a Shin, but a Sin and an Aleph. Naso. Now we're going to look at that word all throughout this Parsha. But we're also going to look at it in different ways because it, we're going to really look at the root of the word, which is actually nun, sin, ness. That's the root of this whole thing. Roots on, on Hebrew words are either two or three letters normally. And so we're going to be looking at the two-letter root called ness. And so that's where we're, I want to start. But I want to begin by looking at that very first couple of verses, actually. So we're starting on chapter five, four, and we're at verse 21, where he begins by saying, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, take a census. Well, the word for census is actually naso. And it's not, a, it's not the way we would normally think of a sentence, sentence, census. He wants him to lift up their heads. And by lifting up their heads, that is a count. And so we're, we're going to follow that, that concept of lifting up all the way through this, this Parsha itself. So it's significant for me to, to pre-warn you as to where we're going to go. Now, the first section deals with dealing with a character called the Gershites, which is one of the three families of Levi. Remember, Levi ha will have three sons. And so in this particular case, the, the lifting up, he wants them to identify all of the males between the ages of 20 and 50, or between 30 and 50. Now, the idea between 30 and 50, well, actually, it's 20 and 50. The idea is, is at this, no, it's 30 and 50. 20 and 60 happens to be the, the number of census for the, all the rest of the tribes. Those tribes, when they went from 20 to 60, they were looking for men for war. This tribe, this time, it is looking not for men for war, but it's looking for those to deal with the system of moving, transporting all of the, the objects of the tabernacle as they move through the wilderness. Now, the Gershites are going to, or the Gersh, try it again, the Gershonites are going to be responsible for taking care of the tapestries, the, the door, the curtains on the doorways, and all of the, the tent paraphernalia, uh, the Kohites are going to take care of all of the, um, what is that, I want to call it. They're going to be looking into carrying the uh, inner, inner workings, the, the, the tabernacles insides. And then finally, the, the last group, the Mary, 
they were going to be responsible for carrying all the wood that was used in the building of the tabernacle, all the posts and poles. Now, as they go through this listing of these three tribes or these three families, clans, they find out the Kohites happen to be 2750, the uh, Gershites happen to be 2630, and finally the Mirites are 3200, which grand total is 8,580. Now, when we went and looked in back in earlier in, in, in Chronicle or in uh, the same book, when we were doing the first section, they added up the book, the characters, and they found out that they were 22,300 of them. So what constitutes the difference? Well, in the beginning, they counted everybody from one month old on. So this little slice that we're looking at is just those men who are capable of serving. It doesn't include all of the rest of the what they would call the men of that of that particular area. So he's lifted up, he's counted, they've separated, they've identified. Now he goes from there to the next section, which deals with again the the blessing itself. Now the blessing, please understand, this is the only blessing in which God speaks it. This is God's blessing. Now, it's repeated by men, but the blessing comes directly from God. And that's the significance of this whole thing. And again, as we're looking at it, it's called Berkat Kohanim, or the priestly blessing. But it has another name. And that other name is very significant because it's Neshiat Kapayim. Neshiat is to lift up. So in other words, we're again, we're going to lift up the pahanim, which are the palms of our hands. That's what's being lifted up at this particular point in time. So the palms of, your, of their hands of the koanim were going to be used to bless the people. Again, we're using the word ness. We're using the root of this whole thing. Now, if you go and actually go through the blessing itself, you'll find out that the blessing is found in three verses. The first verse has three words in Hebrew, second verse has five words, and the third verse has seven words. You can figure out the total there, but the, the interesting thing is really something new, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I want you to understand, even in, in Kabbalah, newness does happen. It's not something that's all ancient, but the idea is that there's 61 words. So when the rabbis began to look at the gematria of this, they divided the 60 or 61 letters. They divided the number of letters by the total value of the words in the blessing itself. What they found was that you actually had, first off, the total was 2,718. And as they began to divide it out, they found out that what they had was called a transcendental number. A transcendental number is not something that can be used in math easily. But what a transcendental number does or can cause is, the, is this idea of um, increase. It, it's dealing with, well, let me read this. This number is best characterized as the number related to compound interest or maximum growth earned. So it's a number that's used in finance. So as we're looking at this whole thing, this raising up, God is actually raising us up and compounding the interest. Now, this sounds either kind of crazy, but we're, going, we're looking at lots of things that are called paradoxes, things that don't really make sense to the normal way of thinking. And so what we're looking at is something that's going to give us a little more, well, it's going to be different than what you've ever learned before, I think. But it's a hint. God is hinting in these three verses that he will compound the interest. Now, by interest, we're talking about us and our growth. As we put into the system, God will increase that. That's what's actually going on with this blessing. And we'll get into the three parts of the blessing a little bit later. But what I want you to understand is the fact that this blessing is more than just simply words on a piece of paper. It's something that's, well, it's very important. 
Now, it was a common practice and still is to, to say this priestly blessing. And if you were in the wilderness walking with them, you would have said it in the morning and you would have said it again in the evening. And as you would have said it, you probably, if it was at all possible, were gathering around the tabernacle. And here around the tabernacle, the Kohanim, the priest, would be standing there with his back to you. And you would be facing him, <coughs> his back. <coughs> Excuse me. You'd be facing his back. And in the process of facing his back, he would pull his talit over his head, covering his hands. He would turn around to face you. And at that point in time, he would create a letter. The letter is called Shin. Now, in the Hebrew, we have five points, dealing mean, meaning he's dealing with the five parts of our speech, our speech, our touch, our sense of smell. All of that is being covered by this. He's blessing us all. Now, some of you, my friend Bobby and I, we're Trekkie fans. So we've known this for a long time. But again, the character called Spock, Leonard Nimoy, spent a lot of time as a Jew. In fact, he grew up in a Jewish home, a very Orthodox Jewish home, and he constantly was found himself in church, synagogue. And as the time he's in the middle of the synagogue, the blessing goes, because it happens and still happens every morning and every evening in the synagogue. It's a part of the prayer. It's not given on Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. Those are the days of judgment. Every other day, it is part of the, of the story. Now, there's several variations on this. One of the things that happens with the Kohanim is he's standing before he gets there. He will wash his hands. Somebody will pour the water over his hands, and he'll go through the formal hand washing. He will slip off his sandals, and he'll stand on the first step so that he is higher than everybody else, representing God who's above. And now in the process of this, many of the people, not being disrespectful, will turn their backs or turn to their side because they're not going to look directly at God because this is God's voice talking to them. Understand that this, there's a great deal of significance in what's being said. Now, sometimes if you happen to be there, you may have children with you, the little boys like the Leonard Nimoy's, who you would put underneath your talit with you. Well, Leonard said one time that he peaked and he got to watch the priest go through the, the formal hands. And so when he was creating a greeting for the Vulcans, he took himself back to those days and he took the shin and he tilted it. He only used one hand, but the concept is still true. And he remember what he said, live long and prosper which is a way of speaking of the three blessings that we're about to look at. Now, the blessings themselves, according to the rabbis, actually comes this way. It first enters the heart of the Kohanim as he speaks. As he's beginning the process of speaking, he raises his hands and forms the, the, the letters and puts his hands either this way, and some say he creates a triangle and he speaks through the triangle. So when he's raising his hands, it's not over his head, but it's at his eyes. In other words, it's as though God is seeing you. That's what's going on. Now, as he's going through this whole process, the energy is going through his hands, to his fingers, to the people. So his hands are going to be tilted forward in the process of going through this. Now, as we go through it, understand he, there are three phrases that are purposeful blessings. The first one is, may God bless you and keep you, or may God bless you and guard you, whichever way you put it. But the blessing is for success, and success, as the Jews understand it, is at work or in the trade or task that you have before you. It's also the idea that he's going to pray for protection. The guarding is the protection of you during times of danger. The second part of the blessing says, may God shine his countenance on you and give you either grace or peace, depending on how you want to write it. But the concept is, in this particular case, God is attempting to enlighten you. 
In other words, as you study the Torah, God's intention is to give you understandings, take you deeper into what is actually written into the words. God does not want us to spend all of our time studying the words simply. That's good for some, but the idea is to move into the task, go deeper into the understanding. Now, the third one is, again, where we get the word ness. The third one begins, may God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lifting of God's countenance, it's the idea he might be listening to your prayers. For example, I spend a lot of time staring into the camera, assuming that you're on the other side staring back at me. So in other words, the conversation is face to face. The conversation is towards us is in a friendly manner. There were times when I got mad, when the person on the other side and I had trouble locking eyes together. I don't know if you've ever had that problem, but when you begin to look at the other person, you have to deal with that person the way you see them. And so sometimes when you, for example, when I had some kids that were misbehaving and they're good kids, I had trouble looking them into the eye. Sometimes I have to tell them, look me in the eye so that they can catch the message that I'm sending. But the idea was the first thing that came out of my mouth is you're a good kid, but, and then we would go through the, but well, God is the same thing. When we know God is listening is when God sees us eye to eye. Now, you and I don't really see him eye to eye, but we have that picture in our mind. Now, normally, you and I, when we look, think of this, we think, well, he's saddened by what we did wrong. And that, in some sense, may be true. But the understanding is beyond that. The understanding is the fact that as if we can get past the, our feelings and focus on what's happening, when you seek God and you repent and you seek to do the right thing, what does God do with what you've just, just done? Well, according to the story, if one does repent, God will take that same action that you did for wrong. Well, use the example, Joseph. Remember, Joseph was taken and thrown into a pit. His brothers were intending to kill him, but they ended up selling him into slavery. Do you remember what Joseph said to them after they repented of what they had done? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. God literally changed a sin into a blessing. When you and I seek forgiveness, God will even take that sin and turn it to good. Because remember, nothing happens on this earth that hasn't first passed through his hands. Everything that we do is controlled. God uses it all. It doesn't seem like it because we see the chaos from our point of view. He sees the pieces being put together differently. And so as we think about it, the idea is the fact that Joseph understood it. Now, later on, Jacob dies. You remember that? They walk the body to the cemetery, and at the cemetery, what's the one thing that happens? They begin again to think that Joseph is going to do something to them because Jacob's no longer around to take care of it. They see, again, this idea of the fact that the sins of the tribes actually are going to be remembered forever, as Joseph would end up saying. But all for good, everything that goes wrong, the, the wrong of the Reubenites when they ended up having an affairs with the, with the uh, Moabites, the Moabite women, all of those things, what Reuben and, and Levi did when, or Simon and Levi did when they went in and, and murdered all of the people of Shechem, all of those things are all going to show or end up being corrected through Teshva, God turns it to good. God takes responsibility for our evil. 
It doesn't seem like it. We should take responsibility, and we do. And if we ask forgiveness, he does forgive us. But remember, he built this world how? He gave us two things, Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Ra. He gave us the ability to do evil. Why? Because in the end, it's going to prove valuable to him. Doesn't make sense to me. It's what we would call a paradox. The paradox is God takes responsibility for all that was that's evil. And in the future, the paradox of how even our transgressions, which are a breach against God, will in some way lead to the ultimate, the ultimate perfection. That's where everything is going to go. We can't see it now because we're looking at the pieces half drawn. We're looking at a position from, well, if we were standing at Mount Sinai and we were looking up and seeing Moses and God together on the mountain, each one of us would have a different view. And that's the way it is when we begin to think and try to understand and reason what's going on. Now, before the the blessing was given, we the, he talked about the fact that his hands were washed and his feet were barren, taken off. There's a process in blessing. The process begins with us. What are our actions? What do we do first? How do we do it? Are we repentant? Are we arrogant? Our actions begin the process, but God doesn't see it the same way we do. He laughs at us for thinking we're so good, our arrogance. But at the same time, the idea is the fact that God is in it all together. Live long and prosper. Now, there's something else that goes on. The congregation is listening to this whole thing. And as they're listening at various points in time, they're called upon to say, Amen. Amen. Now, in the process, then, the, the whole prayer is about let it be so. But it doesn't end there. You see, as they finish the prayer, a second prayer begins. And that's a prayer that they have individually. They want prayer for their negative dreams. You and I, when we go to bed at night, have all kinds of weird dreams normally. Some of them are even profane. Those are the dreams, if we do remember them, that we need to ask forgiveness for. Clear our mind of it. Cleanse ourselves of it. That's what happens each and every day in the morning as they go through the morning blessings, the morning prayers that they go through. It's the idea of keeping clean. It's a motivational thing. We need to seek forgiveness because it will be an encouragement to us and to God. The emphasis has got to be on Teshva, which begins with God, who raises his face towards us and encourages us to look to him. Now, the story goes into 12 tribes. Again, Ness is here. You see, each tribe had to appoint a leader. That leader was called a Nasi. Do you see the relationship between Naso and Nasi? The idea is the fact that this is going to, it comes from the same root. The Nasi is one who is lifted up. The men in the tribe have voted for him. David was made king, but he wasn't made king because God said you're going to be king. He had to earn that. Literally, the tribes voted on him. In the beginning, remember, only Judah voted for him, and so he, his kingdom was in Hebron. Samuel contained the rest of the tribes. Eventually, with the death of Samuel, the, the process changed, and they all voted as a tribe, as a clan, for David. And that's how David became king. There was an election, not one that we would normally think about. We just would simply say, well, he's king because God made him king. Yes, God made him king, but he had to be elected 
king. He had to be lifted up, lifted up. So the 12 tribes, each of the tribes, their leaders had to be lifted up, nasi, at this particular point in time. Now, reading through these 12 tribes, we find that they all bring the same gifts. My wife was asking earlier tonight, well, why'd they all bring the same ones? Wasn't it, was it the fact that they weren't very creative? And the answer is actually the second tribe, Ishakar. You see, after Judah gave their gifts, Ishakar had a choice. What was his choice? What would he bring? Would he bring more or less than what Judah did? Rather than show difference, he showed sameness. And by his actions, the third, the fourth, the fifth, all of the tribes ended up giving exactly the same gifts. They understood equality. And so the tribes, the leaders had been lifted up and in their actions, they reacted as they were supposed to. So everything again is, a, is about the lifting up or the raising up. Now, as I said, these leaders were called Nasi. Nasi is another word for prince, one of royalty. In the story of, of this, well, Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall be successful. He will be exalted. He will be lifted up and attains heights of greatness. Who is he talking about? Who's he talking about? The Messiah. You see, the Messiah is a prince. He will take on the level of a prince. He will move higher than that because God will lift him higher than that. But he starts at that point. You know, there are 13 words that make us understand the word for uh, prince. 13 words. Now, of the 13 words that are used, two of them are very significant. First off, all the words, I sent notes out to some of you, the ten sephirot. God has broken down each of the sephirot. And the sephirot for, for the nasi is understanding. To be a true prince, to be a true leader, one needs understanding. To be a true leader, one also needs to have what's called the, the highness, highness of pleasure. In other words, they're happy to do because they understand. Now, in our story then, as we go on, Nasi then implies elevation. It implies aloofness. God, again, is speaking. It's in the book of Psalms 97.9, where it says, elevated above the days of the world. That's where the Nasi are. Now, in this, in this understanding, notice this, that the person who is elevated, it's about their understanding. It's about their relationship. Now, again, the word for elevated goes back to our root, goes right back to where we started from. Back to Ness. Everything goes there. The Torah, well, nothing else implies the sense of external as nothing. The king is always able to experience pleasure, even in the direct or even in the direst of times because he can see beyond the moments and connects with the eventual perfect outcome of God's plans. That's what Rabbi Wint Mint Pinkas Winston said, and I thought it was pretty interesting. The most basic understanding of this is a paradox, something that we don't normally think about. It's not the way we think. Paradox is opposite of the way we think. Well, Maybe it's not the opposite. The word for paradox is the word 
Nisat, Nisat, you see it? Even in a paradox, Nisat Hafkam, Hafakamin, the idea is lifting of opposites. <sighs> Marriage is a paradox. Marriage is a lifting of opposites. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but again, nisu im is the word for marriage. Do you notice the root? Nis, nes. Marriage is about opposites. Marriage is about elevating opposites. The perfect marriage is the elevation of both members of that process. Now, as we think about this lifting up, we also have to think about the idea of synthesizing the opposites, the blending together of the opposites, something that we normally don't think about, something that I have to think about every day because my wife keeps saying something and then I have to say, yes, dear, I understand. And then we move on from there. Now, in understanding this idea, whether marriage or whether we're talking about the idea of manifesting this understanding of paradox, three things. One, the ability to manifest paradox is the willingness to lift our heads to be appointed for a purpose or mission. We have to be willing to take a mission, to perform a task. Everybody was brought to this earth in order to do work. Now, the question is, what work are we given? Most of us would say, I have no idea why I'm here or what I'm good for. The answer is you're here because God wanted you here and you're in the place that God wanted you and he is going to lift you up to fulfill your part. You are one of those sparks. If we go back to the days in which Adam and Eve were and the day that Adam sinned and fell, one of the things that the rabbi said happened was that Adam is composed of all the souls that will ever be born. We were one of those sparks of Adam's soul at that point in time. We are one of those sparks that God is now lifting up. We have all come here by different routes, but we're all coming here to the same purpose. The next thing that we have to understand is that we have to strive to lift our hands. We have to do that. We're responsible. We're going to become, as the hands became, a conduit. We are his conduit. And finally, we need to forgive ourselves first. You see, it's, I don't know how many pieces of guilt you carry around, but I've got my share. Because what happens is the fact that as we live, we find ourselves doing stupid things at times, things that we can't explain. And sometimes we just, though we pray for, ask God for forgiveness, we just don't let go. We keep hanging on to it. But we have to understand that in order for us to forgive others, we need to learn how to forgive ourselves. We need to be able to look them in the eye just as they're needing to look us in the eye. We are responsible for our own actions and we're responsible for the way we react to others. Things are a paradox. Everything is not normal for us anymore. By that, I mean, one, we know God has different, uh, different rules for us, rules that we tend to live by. He gave us a purpose, and he asked us to be ready when he calls. The second thing we have to understand is we live within, with our hands raised ready to be that conduit, ready to be what he wants us to be. And finally, we are sparks of the Messiah. I have a book. I think I gave it away. There is no Messiah. You are it. Because you see, we're all anointed. We all have purpose. It is our responsibility to be ready to fulfill whatever purpose God has for us. And we may never know what that purpose is until it actually has happened, until it's all over. 
or we may think we've got an answer, but it's only a part of the answer. We are the Messiah. We are anointed for a purpose. We need to remember to lift ourselves up. Not so. God will be with us. That's enough. Thoughts? It's a simple lesson. I don't know why you people just sit there so quietly while I, I just kind of babble on for a half hour. Not so. Anything you want to talk about that's in the Parsha? I don't know. There's two other portions that we didn't talk about. One was soda. And the other one was the Nazarite, the Nazir, the Nazarite and their vows. All of them go to this point of lifting up. I just didn't have time to cover them all. So 